By now, I think we're all familiar with one-time passcodes. They're the pesky but required six-digit codes that enable two-factor authentication and keep all of our accounts secure from hackers and bots. Most of us have likely never given OTPs much thought. It's just a normal part of the modern tech world, but it's actually a massive industry supporting several massive players. You of course have your classic big tech companies including Google's Identity Platform and Amazon's Cognito. You've probably also heard of Duo Mobile and Okta, but have you ever heard of a company called Twilio? Twilio is arguably the king of automated text messages and emails with a peak market cap of over $70 billion. This means that at their peak, they were one of the top 250 largest companies in the world. But more recently, things haven't been looking so bright for this OTP giant. In fact, Twilio stock has fallen 85%, bringing their market cap all the way down to just over $12 billion. It's easy to write off this decline as just a byproduct of the volatile market and recession fears, but there seems to be more to Twilio's story. Not only did they fall much further than big tech, but they have yet to see any sort of recovery, and when you take a look at their financial reports, it all starts to make sense. You see, Twilio has never been a profitable company, having relied on VC funding and stock dilution to keep the business running. This strategy works when revenue is growing exponentially, but not so much when revenue starts to stall out, and that's exactly what's happening to Twilio, who is very much stalling out at the $4 billion mark. To make things worse, it doesn't seem like their expenses are getting any better, meaning that Twilio is currently burning well over a billion dollars every single year. With only $3.5 billion left in the bank, this is not exactly an ideal situation for the company, and it's no wonder why investors are staying away. So join me as we take a look at the rise and fall of the king of OTPs and whether Twilio will ever return to their former glory. Taking a look back, Twilio didn't start off as an OTP company because, well, OTPs weren't even a thing when Twilio was founded back in 2007. The main guy behind Twilio was a software developer and serial entrepreneur named Jeff Lawson. Jeff was a former AWS product manager who was obsessed with perfecting user experiences. In fact, Jeff strongly believes that this is the main job of software engineers, to iteratively understand customers and to build better and better solutions using software. But despite founding three companies before Twilio, Jeff couldn't help but feel that he was constantly falling short in this area, and to him, the reason was obvious, a lack of communication. With traditional businesses, whether it's a retail store or a restaurant, you're constantly able to interact with your customers and get a better feel for what they like, what they don't like, and what could be improved. But with software, while you're able to reach more customers than any traditional business, you're also far more disconnected from your customers. Aside from a random review that might pop up from time to time, there's really no way to directly communicate with customers. So Jeff started looking into ways that he could set up communication infrastructure himself, which is when he ran into a massive reality check. It turns out that building out a communications platform is far harder than building out a software platform. According to Jeff himself, he was used to software development timelines in the weeks. Building out this communication infrastructure, however, would take two to three years and two to three million dollars. Put off by the cost and timeline, Jeff would start looking into big tech solutions, which is when he realized that there was none. And that's when it hit him. If he needed to communicate with customers, it's likely that other developers did as well. And if there was no established solutions on the market, then maybe he could be that solution. And with that, we saw the birth of Twilio, a company that was going to make communications between software companies and users easier than ever. The journey to build this company, however, was by no means easy. The problem was that Jeff needed VC money, and no VC really understood what he was trying to do. In fact, Jeff started off with what he deemed to be a safe pitch, a pitch to a person that he knew pretty well. But this person would end up laughing Jeff out of the room, asserting that Jeff would need an insane amount of salespeople to get this off the ground. This disappointing outcome made it clear to Jeff that he needed proof before he approached VCs, so instead of pitching, he would get to work. 
he would build a simple voice API that was hosted on the cloud that it could make and receive phone calls, and they would launch it on November 20th, 2008. Keep in mind, this was a couple of months before even Google Voice came out, so Twilio was very much early to the game. And as such, they were able to land some pretty big clients pretty quickly. This included the likes of Cheetos, Earth911, Tumblr, and Sony Music. It turned out that Twilio Voice was also super helpful for politicians who wanted to automate the process of calling voters. With these customers in his back pocket, Jeff would return to the VC table, and let's just say, he would be taken a lot more seriously. In early 2009, Twilio would complete a seed funding round raising $600,000. If you're familiar with Chris Saka from Shark Tank, he was one of Twilio's seed investors. They would follow this up with a Series A round of funding just a couple of months later, raising $3.7 million. Now that Twilio had money, Jeff would double down on his sales effort. According to Jeff, the key to growing Twilio was treating developers like customers. You see, a lot of enterprise companies get into the habit of treating developers as second-tier customers, and it's no wonder why. When you're serving developers, considerations like public reputation and brand image aren't nearly as important. Not to mention, there's only a handful of developer solutions for any given market, so developers aren't that likely to switch to another service provider in the first place. So companies often tend to treat developers as just a strategy to reach more end users and make their experience even better. As a software developer, Jeff was all too aware of this reality, and he wanted Twilio to be different. He wanted Twilio to put developers first and treat developers as customers, and this has really been their strategy. They would sponsor hackathons, run hackathons, and hand out a bunch of shirts to developers. In fact, at one point, Jeff would make the prediction that Twilio would hand out more shirts to developers than BlackBerry would ship phones. Looking back, this wasn't too hard given that BlackBerry would fall off a cliff, but I think you get the idea. Twilio was reaching a lot of developers. As their reach grew, Twilio also focused on expanding their product line, which led to the creation of their text messaging API in February of 2010. Initially, this wasn't meant for OTPs. Rather, it was meant for updating customers. For example, messages like, your shipment is on the way, or your package is out for delivery. It wasn't until mid-2011 that Twilio launched their shortcode API platform, and this is when all of Jeff's original worries came back to life. With their voice API and original SMS API, infrastructure wasn't too big of a concern because the volume wasn't too large. But with OTPs, companies would be sending out millions if not tens of millions of messages on a daily basis. So not only did Twilio need strong infrastructure, but they also needed rock solid deals with carriers to process and send so many text messages. Twilio also had to worry about preventing spam and abuse of the platform. To be honest, Twilio never really figured out the solution to this issue, but luckily for Twilio, investors had. Back in 2007, investors didn't quite understand the value of Twilio, but by the early 2010s, they knew exactly what they were in for, and they were willing to back Twilio to the moon. This included $12 million in late 2010, $17 million in late 2011, $130 million in 2015, and a $150 million IPO in 2016. That's really how Twilio addressed the infrastructure problem. They just raised and spent a bunch of money. But while that worked in the early days, as Twilio became a mature company, investors started looking for profitability and ROI, which brings us into Twilio's current crisis. The reality is that Twilio is having an extremely rough time achieving profitability. They've already tried doing layoffs, multiple times actually. Last September, they laid off 11% of their staff, and earlier this year, they laid off another 17% of their staff. So within the past year alone, they've cut their workforce by almost a third, and they're still burning over a billion dollars per year. And the reality is that this situation is more a result of the industry as opposed to Twilio themselves. You see, the communications API industry has become extremely cutthroat, especially with Google and Amazon stepping into the arena. These juggernauts view the industry in a completely different light. 
To them, the communications API industry is just a small portion of one sector of one division of their business. They frankly don't care about the sector more than just controlling it and telling their enterprise customers that they offer these solutions as well. AKA, Google nor Amazon really care about their SMS business being profitable. For them, it's all about the bigger picture. It's about locking in Walmart or Ford as their next massive cloud customer. If that means that Walmart and Ford get subsidized OTPs, so be it, it's more than worth it. The same, however, cannot be said about Twilio, whose main business itself is communications, meaning that this itself has to be profitable. And according to Twilio themselves, they don't expect gap profitability till 2027. With that being said, the good news is that Twilio has a really strong pool of customers, including Uber, Airbnb, Instacart, Reddit, and Lyft, just to name a few. And it's unlikely that these companies will move away from Twilio anytime soon, because Twilio has won over the developers at these companies with their developer-first mindset. And as long as Twilio has a strong roster of customers, it's unlikely that investors will stop supporting Twilio. Worst case scenario, they have a couple of rough years until they achieve profitability, after which they'll be good to go. Also, Google and Amazon are by no means trying to take down Twilio. In fact, they actually support Twilio. Just recently, Twilio partnered with Google to create better AI-powered virtual customer support. And Amazon has even gone as far as investing in Twilio, buying up a 1% stake in the company. But at the same time, this could also be perceived as bad news. You have a strong company with strong customers that's facing a cash flow problem. That makes them the perfect acquisition target. Google and Amazon could easily put up the $12 billion to buy the company, and they would have a far easier time handling the expenses with their in-house infrastructure. They may even be able to achieve profitability with Twilio, but even if they don't, it doesn't really matter because they would have a new list of customers that they could sell Google Cloud or AWS to. For the sake of Twilio and in hopes of preventing big tech from controlling yet another industry, hopefully Twilio is able to make it through on their own, but only time will tell. Another fallen giant that's surprisingly beating the odds is Nokia. Check out this video to learn more, but until then, I'm Hari and I'll see you guys on the next one.